Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Al Weinrub. I'm the coordinator of the local Clean Energy Alliance situated in Oakland, California. Uh, <clears throat> our alliance is uh, basically set up with a proposition that uh, renewable, uh, local renewable energy can be a, a great uh, uh, way of empowering our communities uh, to address the economic and, and other needs of our communities. Uh, we have a panel this morning, which is a lead-off panel on a uh, on a workshop track that um, that's going to take place at the conference called Democratizing Energy, which is going to look into various aspects of, uh, of what uh, many people who are working in the country around this notion of energy democracy, uh, what they're doing and how they're thinking and whatnot. We wanted to start off with some of the leaders of that movement uh, giving a, a, an overview of some of their ideas about what, what they envision uh, energy democracy to mean and how that plays into their work. Um, and our panelists are uh, Mia Yoshitani, who is the executive director of the Asian Pacific Environmental Network, uh, in, also located in Oakland, California, but does statewide work. Uh, uh, Clark uh, Gocker, who is with uh, Push Buffalo uh, here in town. He's the director of policy and strategy, and we'll be talking about some of the work that Push Buffalo is doing in the energy democracy space, and Denise Fairchild, who is the executive director of Emerald Cities Collaborative, which is a national effort located, uh, you know, that works in a number of cities around the country, and I trust that you'll all be talking, you know, about your work as we go on. What I'd like to do is to just uh, take a couple moments to sort of frame this whole question of energy democracy uh, and uh, and you know, how people are thinking about it and moving generally in the country around it. Uh, for how many of you uh, that are at the workshop today, is this sort of a new concept and you're here to sort of understand more uh, what it's about? And how many are actually in their work engaged in some way in trying to do energy democracy work? Okay, so we have a mix about half and half. And, uh, you know, we'll try to just uh, go through quickly uh, a little bit of framing so that we're sort of all starting uh, from the same place. Um, uh, so just to begin, I mean, this conference uh, that we're doing this weekend is on, uh, you know, setting up and creating a new economy. And, uh, you know, uh, so the whole notion of energy fits into our concept of what a new economy is. And I think, you know, most of us understand that uh, the new economy has to have, you know, certain kinds of characteristics. Like, it, you know, it, it's got to be non-extractive meaning it's not just basically extracting the resources of the earth and resources of people, labor, you know, in order to, uh, to, to build on itself, and that it's not oppressive, that it's a new economy that represents, uh, you know, justice for, you know, all our uh, communities. And, um, you know, this new economy stands in contrast uh, to the old economy, uh, uh, which is really one that's, uh, for the last several hundred years, been built on uh, fossil fuels. Uh, so energy has, to a large extent, really been the driver uh, of that uh, new economy. You know, all economic activity takes, you know, energy uh, to move it, to create it, uh, to push it. I mean, that's what energy basically is. It's the ability to do work, to do things, to create and transform our environment. And uh, so energy is, whenever you're talking about an economy, you're, you're always thinking uh, about what is the energy base and the energy driver of that economy. And, you know, historically, it was based on, um, you know, on human power and animal power uh, in earlier uh, societies, and then came the age of industrialization, and we saw that industrialization was first built on, on coal power, you know, the whole steam revolution, and then uh, on oil uh, as, a, as an important way of, like, transforming the economy because it allowed for uh, engines that move around and so on and so forth, and also the diversification of uh, industrialization in that geographical sense. And then yeah, later on, you know, the whole notion that you could use those fossil fuels to create electricity, which is even more versatile in terms of its ability to really be adaptable to human needs in various places at various times, so long as you had a wire, of course, from the generating station to the plant. But basically, the electric generation being based on uh, fossil fuels, and then later, of course, uh, nuclear power as well. So, you know, all these things, uh, uh, you know, have been really the basis and the driver uh, for what, what, is a, what a, a new economy or any economy uh, can do. And in, in the particular case of our current economy, 
we know that it, it's driven largely by uh, the, the drive to accumulate capital, you know, and to, to continue to extract and, and, uh, and exploit uh, the resources and, and uh, exploit labor in order to create uh, a capital in the hands of, 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 as it turns out, fewer and fewer uh, people. So um, it basically, our, our old economy is built on the destruction of, of people and the planet uh, put uh, quite, uh, you know, to try to capture that in its most succinct uh, fashion. Um, and the energy model then that, you know, that accompanies uh, that particular economy is a very uh, centralized and corporate uh, energy model where energy resources have been privatized, they're owned by a very limited uh, few uh, classes of people, uh, and the control of it is really outside the hands of the democratic process uh, for all intents and purposes. So the new economy that we're talking about requires an energy model that's a very different kind of energy model. Uh, if we really want to talk about a new economy in the way that we're talking about, then we have to have uh, an energy model that sort of that fits into that, um, in, into that, in that economy and helps it grow and prosper and, and meet the needs uh, of our people. And then uh, I think we all know just instinctively at this point in time that that means it's got to be based on renewable energy uh, for a minimum because what we've seen is that uh, not only did fossil fuels uh, basically pollute and kill many people in the environment, especially at the sites of extraction and uh, where it's burned for, energy, for electricity and whatnot, but it also now has, uh, since the 1980s, it's been recognized that it's also killing the planet uh, as well as the people. So we definitely need to switch to a renewable energy uh, kind of base, but uh, to say uh, uh, renewable energy if, it's, if we have a transition to renewable energy that just reproduces the economic system that we have right now, we really haven't done very much. We've maybe saved a couple of years, maybe a generation off, the life, uh, off of life on the planet, but this kind of economy is, is so destructive that even without the carbon dioxide, it's going to kill us all anyway. So what we need to do is to think about what is the nature uh, of this uh, different energy model that we want to propose. And, uh, or that we need. And so uh, the f on the first uh, level, we know that that means that we have to take that centralized control that's in the hands of very few people and we got to really uh, spread that so that energy becomes uh, controlled and owned uh, in, more in common, you know, by our communities or in, in, by public entities. Um, so that's sort of the basic proposition of you know, like the new energy model is that it's a public, it's community-based and community-owned, but it has to have a couple of other characteristics as well, and uh, those are that it has to be sustainable. Uh, we need to have energy systems that are not going to destroy the planet, and so when we talk about sustainable energy systems, we're talking about really trying to reduce the footprint, uh, the energy footprint, you know, of our societies so that uh, basically uh, we have sort of like what we call like a net, net zero communities or net zero regions or just like you can have a net zero energy house where you basically the amount of energy that you consume is matched by the amount of energy that you can produce. You know, at the first approximation, that's where we want to go. In order to survive, we really have to decrease that energy footprint because, as I say, if you gobble up the earth based on renewable energy, you're still gobbling up the earth. Um, and then it has to be equitable. Uh, this is what we learn is that the energy model that meets the new economic model has to be equitable, it has to bring justice, it has to be built, built on justice. So that's our notion of, uh, you know, of a new energy model, what we generally call a decentralized energy model because not only is it, uh, is it based on renewable energy which is available everywhere, but the ownership and the control is decentralized and the power over that you know, it's sort of in the hands of our community. And as we talked about last night, that the new economy has to be centered in people of color and communities of color uh, in the historic, you know, historic, to right the historic injustices. Uh, if we're gonna really, uh, we need that to be true of the energy system as well as the economic system as a whole. So that's what we call the decentralized energy model. And just to, just to, to be clear, you know, we know that what's happening in the country right now, there's a mad rush. Uh, to build renewable energy, you have calls for 100% renewables all the time. 
uh, without any discussion about who owns and controls or what the nature of this energy is going to look like. In many cases, it's just a reproduction of the old system. But now a new wave of people uh, understand that you know, maybe the best way to go to renewable energy is a more distributed energy system to be able to utilize renewable energy, which is actually distributed, you know, across the planet and in various places, to sort of capture that by redesigning the grid so that the grid can support a more uh, distributed energy model. But I just want to point out that there's just, this is being turned into a huge market opportunity with all the big players moving in to try to grab the spoils. Uh, it's not about the democratization of the energy system at all. It's still with the utilities in control of that system and the same parties and bankers and the financial institutions and whatnot. And there's nothing about it uh, that has anything to do with justice or sustainability or, or any of those things. So that also is not what we mean by democratizing energy. What we mean by democratizing energy is really uh, not achieved by this rush for distributed energy resources. It might be helpful, but so long as it's not under community control uh, with the type of characteristics that we've been talking about, uh, it's not really about uh, democratizing energy. So that's just a framing uh, a little bit about, you know, some of the broad strokes about when we talk about democratizing energy, it's a little bit about what we're not talking about as well. And, you know, most of the environmental movement and the folks that are active in calling for renewable energy tend to drop out the essential features uh, of what we're really trying to, to achieve and where we're trying to move. So I just wanted to sort of lay that basic framework so uh, as we go into and hear about what our guests uh, have to say that uh, we understand that we all start sort of at that same uh, kind of place. Um, so with that, uh, and I hope I haven't taken up too much time or said things that everybody already knows. Uh, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Mia to talk about a little bit of the work uh, and the perspective that the uh, Asian Pacific Environmental Network uh, has. Just to say the format that we're going to use here this morning is uh, uh, that each of the panelists is going to give a few minute presentation uh, trying to lay out, you know, that vision and how it enters into the work. And then we'll have a little conversation amongst ourselves, you know, to maybe poke at each other or whatever about what's been said. And then we'd like to turn it over to uh, questions from you. Did, did you all get cards when you came in to be able to fill out questions and whatnot? So, okay, so great. So as we're going through, if, uh, I'm told that's the way we're supposed to do it rather than passing around a mic. So uh, as we're going through, if you have something that uh, you, you feel you want to be able to comment on or raise a question about, please uh, fill that out and we'll do the best we can to, 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 to capture those, uh, those questions and comments. Uh, so, sorry Mia, if, if you don't mind, take it away. No, sure, thanks Al. Um, good morning everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, thanks for being here in this cavernous giant hallway to listen to us on stage. I just want to acknowledge the awkwardness of us sitting up on, on the stage, but we're doing it for a purpose because this is actually being recorded and uh, I think it's being live streamed right now. So um, think of yourself as uh, a few uh, in the much bigger audience <laughs> that is um, out in the interwebs. Um, but uh, I'm really glad that uh, we actually have a group of folks to talk to today. Um, I'm gonna just start off with, um, oh, before I get into it, Al, just tell me, I have no concept of time right now. So I'll tell you in about yeah, 10 minutes. tell me when, to shut up when I yeah. shut up, okay. Um, so again, my name's Mia Yoshitani. I'm the executive director of the Asian Pacific Environmental Network. APEN is an environmental justice organization that started almost 25 years ago. Um, back when I was actually living in a college dorm as I am <laughs> for the last couple of days. <laughs> yes, exactly. Deja vu. Um, <clears throat> no, but APEN was started as an environmental justice organization organizing low-income Asian and Pacific Islander immigrant and refugee communities in the Bay Area um, around environmental justice. And I thought I would tell a little bit about kind of the origins of our work because that's kind of how we got into energy democracy. We kind of, um, I think, um, you know, energy democracy, we don't actually even use that term with our, with the, with the communities that we organize in. We just, <clears throat> we just call it our, 
our organizing work. Um, but we kind of backed into energy democracy because um, we've been organizing for a quarter of a century um, just the immigrant and refugee communities that live in Richmond, California around uh, the Chevron refinery um, alongside other communities of color, in particular African-American communities who've been there much longer for over a century, um, organizing at the, what we like to think of as one of the many ground zeros of the root causes of the extractive economy and the root cause of climate change. <clears throat> so. I like to say that because um, people often talk about how low-income communities, communities of color, are, are the most vulnerable to, to um, the impacts of climate change that are somehow in the future. Um, we've actually, our communities have been um, at the center of the root causes of climate change from the very beginning. So as we talk about the fossil fuel industry and the kind of history of, of the trail of misery that the fossil fuel industry has, has um, kind of imposed around the world. Richmond is just one of those communities that's part of that, that's in, that, in, that, in one of those ground zeros that starts in places where they are actually um, digging up fossil fuels, building pipelines for fossil fuels, transporting fossil fuels where they're, they are, um, you know, displacing people off of land where they are poisoning people in the places that they live. And so the, the residents of Richmond, California is just another community on that pipeline of, of, um, of exploitation and extraction in the fossil fuel economy. And so our place in, in that has been in organizing on, on the, the, the refinery end of, of <clears throat> the oil industry and looking at how um, communities can um, end the reliance on that part of the extractive economy and build something new and uh, build an alternative to that, uh, build an alternative to the cumulative impacts and the, um, also the economic displacement that comes with a major fossil fuel industry in your backyard. So it's not just, uh, so it's these two things, it's, it's, um, it's the, the ongoing and incredible health impacts that communities have had to live with and continue to live with, um, even under the new regime in California of, of reducing greenhouse gases, they continue to allow the biggest of our polluters to pollute in the communities that are the most vulnerable. And these are the same communities that are most vulnerable to the ongoing impacts of climate change. So in, uh, we always talk about climate change as a threat multiplier. So it's a threat mul multiplier to all the existing inequalities that are already in place. So if, if your community is one of many that are um, experiencing the health impacts of the fossil fuel industry already, then that gets exacerbated. If you are vulnerable to displacement for housing, that's get, that gets exacerbated. If you're vulnerable in, um, to economic disparity, that gets exacerbated all by climate change, rising energy prices, rising food prices, rising transportation prices. Um, these are all um, things that we're dealing with now and will only get worse in the future. And so seeing that in our, our communities, kind of looking at that, kind of coming down the road at them, uh, felt like, um, we needed to engage in not just stopping or ending the extractive economy, but engage in what's the new system that we want. What do we want um, as an alternative, and how can that alternative help actually displace the, the extractive economy that exists there right now? Um, and so we kind of reluctantly got into energy policy, which is, um, as many of you may have experienced in this room, energy policy arena is not really the most welcoming to, um, to communities, communities of color in particular, especially communities of color who don't speak English as their first language. Um, <clears throat> and kind of ending up in uh, arenas like the Public Utilities Commission or the Air Resources Board or all these acronyms um, of, 
of the policy arena that are kind of set up, put in place in particular to, to uh, keep people, regular people, out of that, even though these are the places where some of the most important decisions that impact our lives are made. Um, but we decided if, as we see the impacts of climate change coming, and we also see the state of California investing billions of dollars in an energy transition, both public and private money being invested in, into changing our energy system, for, as Al said, from fossil fuels to renewable energy, which on the very surface you can, you can celebrate and say, woohoo, that's what needs to happen. Of course, we need, we need renewable energy to stop polluting communities. But at the same time, if we are just replacing the fossil fuel system with a renewable energy delivery system that basically just, for one, keeps the centralized nature of energy in place so that like basically um, when you're talking about the extractive economy, the way we talk about it with our members is um, what's been happening is that like the profit model for how energy gets delivered to your home um, is, is based on uh, spending as much money on that um, infrastructure of delivering it from like a, a centralized place um, and, and putting a lot of money into that whole infrastructure of transmission. And, and th that's part of their profit model. And if, if we're actually just replacing that um, and replacing a system of investment that gives most of the, pro that extracts um, the, the, the income of, of local communities into that system and then puts the profits all in the hands of investors like Goldman Sachs, then whether you're doing it with um, coal or uh, natural gas or sunshine, you're actually, you're not, you're not, you're not that, that's a transition, it's not a just transition. And then you're missing a, a huge opportunity to shift the systemic problems of our energy system and actually use climate change as not just a threat multiplier, but as a equity multiplier. You're, you're missing that opportunity. And so we are seeing this happen in California, which is probably the state that's invested the most in renewable energy so far. And I felt like what I was looking at was like a freight train of renewable energy coming to like basically either roll over or completely pass by our communities. And at the same time, in the communities where there is the most pollution, those are the communities that are the, that are the least likely currently to benefit from renewable energy, the benefits of, of better air quality and the benefits of a stronger local economy. Um, and seeing that, we just, we felt like um, we had to get involved. It was yet another one of those things that it wasn't really a choice. We weren't saying, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we got involved in the energy economy? It was, it was we were already engaged in the energy economy just by virtue of where we live and where our communities are, um, are vulnerable. And so there, we kind of got into it as most vulnerable communities do, not by, not by choice, but by necessity. Do you want to say a few words about the work that you're doing in that arena? No, I'm just kidding. Yes, I do. Okay. Um, so... That was just a, a, a nudge because <laughs> we're 10 minutes in, but please take the time to do that. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm, I'm in my final third of my paper. <laughs> okay, um, so then what does energy democracy look like on the ground? Um, for us, there are a few things that, um, that is a starting point. And one, I guess the, the values of energy democracy, which to me is about three things. It's about health, it's about wealth, and it's about self-determination. So health, wealth, self-determination determination all in service to communities who have been hardest hit by the extractive economy and by the 
fossil fuel, uh, dirty energy economy. So that's the values that it sits in. How you kind of make that real, for us it's been starting with, um, starting with a framework that actually forces real reductions in emissions. So you actually have to have this, this um, mechanism that says um, polluters actually have to stop polluting. <laughs> they have to ratchet down their pollution over a sh very short period of time. So you need real caps on emissions and not, what, not, not the types of caps that allow for big polluters to say, um, well, we're going to continue to pollute here, but if we trade our ability to pollute with someone who's growing trees over here, then it's all the same, right? We're, then we're, we're, we're all kind of uh, on measure, we're reducing greenhouse gases. But sorry, Richmond, you're going to continue to be the, um, the carbon ground zero. And, and with that carbon, all the other um, pollution that comes along with it that causes asthma at some of the highest rates in the country. So you, you need real, re real emission reductions in, in local communities, like in place from the source. You need um, to build the new energy infrastructure. You also need policies that, that, make, that force polluters to pay. So you force polluters to pay and invest in new infrastructure. What does that infrastructure look like? For us, it looks like, and that's important uh, uh, for us, uh, as some of the folks in the room probably know, like we come from a, um, um, a environmental justice set of principles, one of the first of which is we speak for ourselves. So energy democracy may look different for you or for you or for you. For us, it looks a certain way because these are the solutions that work for our community. So for our community, we want to see renewable energy that is not industrial scale, but it's small scale, so that it fits actually in our neighborhoods, so that it's not out, built out in the desert, spending expensive, uh, or like building new transmission lines, new infrastructure to get it from there to our community, and have people who have the, the jobs that are created are not actually being created in the community. So you want local infrastructure that is small scale enough to fit in into the neighborhood and that's also investing in on um, public infrastructure and with um, community ownership so local small scale decentralized with the highest number of quality jobs possible with the highest number of actual quality union jobs possible and that democratizes the control over that energy so that the who decides where that energy is built and what happens with the, with the income or resources that are generated from that energy is decided by the same people who have been at the burden of, of the biggest polluters. So we wanna make sure that we are localizing as much as possible, small scale, decentralized, and local control. Um, to do that, you need in place, um, energy democracy is just as much about uh, people power as it is about actual renewable energy power. So none of this works in a framework absent of deep organizing leadership development and building power in communities. So that, that has to be in place because you don't actually dismantle a system without real power. And so for us, it has also meant organizing civic engagement work in the community that's connected to a broader movement, a multiracial coalition an alliance that um, is interested not just in the energy part, but is interested in a much broader vision of just transition, racial justice, 
and equity in the community and that has a, um, a vision in place for what our communities can really look like when we actually achieve the real just transition. So that seems like a perfect place to end. Well, great, thank you. Thank you, Mia. So there's a lot of stimulating things to think about there. And uh, <laughs> let's move on to uh, Clark. I talk a little bit about um, Push Buffalo, the perspective coming there and some of the work that you're doing. Great. <clears throat> Thanks so much. And just uh, uh, welcome, everybody. I'm grateful to you know, be included in such an esteemed panel here. Um, and yeah, so I'm Clark Gawker. Uh, I work for a local organization here in Buffalo called People United for Sustainable Housing. Um, and you know, I think kind of like uh, Mia uh, alluded to in her comments, you know, push has kind of backed its way into energy democracy. Um, and so I think really what I want to do in, in my time this morning is uh, just to present kind of a brief uh, cross-examination of energy democracy uh, through the lens of an emerging energy and climate policy and regulatory landscape in New York State. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the path I think I, I'll set for myself here. And you know, before I get into that, you know, I, I will kind of say, like, uh, first introduce PUSH a little more. We're, we're 10 years old. Um, we're a, a low-income uh, member-based organization uh, that started to tackle kind of the twin issues of economic justice and joblessness uh, and, and, and quality housing uh, in a, a residential neighborhood on the west side of, of Buffalo. Um, that uh, historically has suffered from, from disinvestment, um, from uh, uh, you know, forms of segregation uh, in the school system, uh, in the housing market. Um, and currently it's a, it's a very di diverse community. It's, it's multiracial. Um, it's a, a, a base of refugee and immigrant resettlement uh, in the wider Buffalo community. Um, and it's one of the highest poverty neighborhoods in, in Buffalo. Uh, and uh, it has some of the oldest housing stock in the country. Um, so those are all, I think, important considerations when we're talking about uh, energy democracy and, and access to energy. Um, so how do we back into energy democracy? I think it, it really came about through three kind of foundational um, strategies and campaigns uh, that, that, that we led, you know, dating back now to um, kind of the, the mid-2000s. Uh, and, and in each of those, I think we had kind of a fundamental interest in changing um, the, our, our members' relationship to energy, uh, really based on the, the needs and, and, uh, that they've communicated and, and, and kind of bring to the table uh, and some of those um, uh, kind of indi indicator level conditions in the neighborhood. Uh, and I think what we recognized early on was that you know, those relationships to energy are often mediated by uh, institutional interests that don't have community members' interests uh, at heart, or there's a, just a fundamental misalignment uh, that leads to, to inequity and injustice. Um, and so the, 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 the first arena in which we kind of engaged with these issues was uh, around uh, uh, corporate accountability. That was kind of the, the underlying principle that we sought to um, move through a, a campaign that targeted our natural gas utility uh, in, the, in the region. And that was really rooted in our members' experience of <clears throat> kind of a cycle of energy poverty uh, that in a, a, a community such as Buffalo in the northeast of, of the country, uh, that's a cycle that recurs uh, every heating season um, and, and kind of waxes and wanes as, as folks, you know, uh, maybe move off uh, natural gas utility service in the summer months to come back on in the winter months and to face you know, serious arrearages and, and to have just suffered the trauma of, of, of racialized shutoffs in, in many cases. Um, and, and some of the, the deeper root causes are, are tied to that old housing stock. Many of the homes that, that folks in our community live in are 100, 120 years old. Um, and the, the, the kind of the dominant set of property relations are such that uh, many, if not most, of our members find themselves as uh, renters and so really lack uh, kind of material control over, uh, over their homes uh, enough to, um, you know, if, if, if resources are available, you know, enough to tackle those, those kind of root causes uh, in terms of building conditions. Um, kind of the, the second area, so, so in that first area, I think accountability, that's kind of, I think, one of those underlying principles that, that we, I think, have, have grabbed onto that then 
um, have, have moved us into the energy democracy space and, and really kind of um, form part of that kind of foundational bedrock of what we think energy democracy is and, and, and needs to be. Uh, the second is around community control. Um, and again, in terms of folks' relationship to energy, uh, you know, historically people in our neighborhood have lacked access to uh, services and markets that can provide uh, the, the, the megawatts they need, right? So the energy they, they won't use, right? So energy efficiency services, weatherization services, uh, there have often been uh, either through a lack of access to capital that, that you can trace back to um, uh, credit and, and, and other financial issues uh, or, or other barriers. Um, or folks have suffered kind of, I think conversely, uh, a condition of, of predatory targeting. You know, they've been um, uh, engaged by uh, uh, industry in, in predatory ways. Uh, and in New York, I think that, that cuts across, you know, both the, the, the home performance and energy efficiency kind of industry actors in our local markets, uh, as well as uh, energy service companies, which are on the scene as, as New York is a deregulated uh, utility state. Um, and then the, the third is uh, uh, capacity building. And you know, PUSH has taken a very uh, explicit place-based uh, approach to our work. And, uh, and I think for many of you this afternoon, if you're out uh, on the 2 p.m. tour of the uh, PUSH's Green Development Zone, you'll kind of see firsthand you know, what some of those place-based interventions look like. Uh, but in that regard, I think you know, we were looking to, uh, again, in that, on that relationship to energy theme, uh, again, industry, I think, is, is a culprit there, and I think we're in building capacity in our community, in place, through, uh, you know, rehabbing our affordable housing stock, or rehabbing our vacant and abandoned housing stock to be affordable housing, uh, kind of leveraging those projects for purposes of job training, uh, for, for leveraging uh, a portfolio of projects for purposes of, of community-based participatory planning. You know, the, we were responding to conditions in which uh, you know, people in the community have been kind of alienated from energy, uh, kind of at the level of production, you know, haven't had access to uh, a labor market in which, you know, they could be kind of on the front lines of building new uh, uh, green affordable housing um, or, or, or new clean energy assets. So, so those are some of the kind of the foundational elements of our work. Uh, and again, those key principles, accountability, community control, and capacity building are kind of what have emerged for us as, as kind of the bedrock of energy democracy for, for us and our members. Um, and that's, I think, I'll segue now in, into kind of the, the, uh, the, you know, the policy landscape in New York um, and say that's kind of at the level at which we engage our members and have brought them into uh, what is, I think, a very complicated and complex and intentionally so uh, a policy and regulatory environment um, and have sought to challenge uh, some, some pretty uh, revolutionary developments in the state that are uh, uh, right now kind of uh, ground zero for those are in the uh, electricity sector and are, are being led from uh, the governor's office on down through the Public Service Commission and the state's energy agency, NYSERDA, and are seeking to um, reform the, the retail uh, electricity markets and, and, and utility business models in New York to transition them away from a, an old centralized model that, that relied on uh, uh, you know, fossil fuel based generation you know, moving to a more decentralized and distributed energy future. Um, but doing so in ways that, that don't undermine uh, the utilities uh, uh, bottom line, their ability to, to, to generate profit. Um, and that opened up new opportunities and new market spaces for kind of third-party distributed energy resource solution providers. So, and those kind of are, are proliferating in, in uh, numbers that I think it's kind of hard to keep track of. I think right now we can recognize those third-party providers as, you know, solar PV installers. So some are, are known to us. They've been here for a while. I think some are more... Uh, uh, kind of emerging on the, the backs of uh, kind of emerging technologies and as our homes get smarter I think we'll see more products that are being kind of marketed to, uh, to, to all of us and I think in, again in maybe predatory ways to, to more marginalized communities uh, that, that try to kind of capture value streams that are being generated through this, uh, through this transition. 
Um, so, so part of that context in New York is that utilities, their business model is changing. Uh, they're being taxed, tasked now with coordinating these regional clean energy markets, uh, sending kind of price signals uh, to these third-party distributed energy resource uh, solution providers, um, and you know, essentially enabling new markets that you know, we fear are going to shut out uh, our members, that are going to shut out uh, uh, you know, communities that, that uh, you know, lack resources and capacity to participate. Um, I think another, uh, I think, key development in New York is that um, while there is a mix of public and private investment driving this, this reform agenda, uh, it's, there's an imbalance afoot, and it's, the state has made it as a policy goal uh, to, to remove rate payers. So that's you know, utility customers who historically have propped up energy efficiency and renewable energy programs, to, to remove them from the mix. So essentially to, to take the public out of the, um, this transition, and we think that's problematic. Uh, and they think that you know, uh, for, uh, uh, access or sources of capital uh, can be found on Wall Street. Um, and can be leveraged by these um, kind of evolving uh, electric distribution utility business models. Um, so, so we have concerns about just the introduction of extractive forms of finance, of investment capital into our communities that's enabled by these regulatory reforms. Um, and then I think kind of in addition to that, I think the state has held up um, affordability as a priority in this transition. Um, I think where we have concerns with that is that uh, the, they're operationalizing their notions of affordability and, and affordable programs uh, absent consultation with, with poor people or uh, under-resourced communities. And, and, uh, and so I think while the, the intent is good, I think the, uh, the strategy that they've pursued to kind of flush out an affordability agenda is, is seriously flawed. So. We've kind of arrived at the kind of the threshold of, of energy democracy through some of our historical campaigns. We're cognizant now of this uh, uh, kind of evolving regulatory and policy landscape in New York. Uh, and that's pretty daunting. And so I think our strategy has really lied at the level of, of coalition building and collaboration. And, um, and to, to that end, we've joined forces with uh, uh, over, over a dozen grassroots, community-based and environmental organizations across New York State uh, in, in kind of mid-2014 to form uh, the New York State Energy Democracy Alliance. And we've kind of set out to, to challenge and influence kind of at every turn uh, this regulatory agenda that's been rolled out by, by the governor. Um, and some of the issues there that we're, uh, you know, fighting for um, are to uh, essentially displace uh, electric distribution utilities from this, this transition. Um, as I mentioned, they, they stand to gain market power in our estimation uh, as, as their business model shifts to a more decentralized model. And so we'd made early calls to actually create a new publicly controlled institution uh, that could supplant existing investor-owned utilities from, from performing that role of, of distributed system uh, provider. Um, and on that too, again, in, a, in, in the New York State context, as a deregulated utility state, uh, back in the late 90s, regulators uh, uh, removed the ability uh, from distribution util or, or from electricity utilities to own generating uh, capacity. So they, they could survive as distribution utilities, but they'd source you know, the energy that, that's generated and that ultimately reaches our homes and businesses uh, from, from independent power producers. Um, with this uh, new reform agenda, the state's kind of rolling back that, and we've been fighting that. And so one really material way in which that's happened is they've, they've, they've given uh, existing distribution utilities the ability to own generating assets in low-income communities if, there's, uh, if the utility can demonstrate some market failure. Um, and so that's actually happening currently through kind of a, a piloting and a, and a demonstration uh, a strategy the state's using. And again, if you're on a tour this afternoon at 2 p.m., one of the communities, this won't be really touched on probably at all, if, if, but definitely not directly. Uh, but right now, the, the national grid, the incumbent uh, electricity, uh, electric utility, 
uh, is, is running with one of these pilots in which they're installing utility-owned solar panels on low-income homes uh, in the Fruit Belt neighborhood in Buffalo. Uh, and again, kind of outside of the purview of, of uh, you know, democratic decision-making and, and uh, community engagement. Um, so, so that's one of the fronts we've been fighting on. You know, another is uh, the state has committed $5 billion of ratepayer money over the next 10 years to support the transition to a distributed energy future. It sounds like a lot of money, and it is, but it's actually half the amount that the preceding 10 years uh, the state had collected from ratepayers and directed to, for similar purposes. So that's part of that, that rollback. Uh, and, and in that context, you know, we've been calling on the state to dedicate 40% uh, of those ratepayer revenues to uh, frontline communities, to environmental justice communities, and to low and moderate income communities that really reflects their share of, you know, demographically, the, um, uh, you know, kind of the money in, uh, in, into that $5 billion pot. And we think, you know, as, as an e uh, equity claim, there should be a, a distributional uh, or proportional redistribution of those funds to those communities. Um, and kind of, uh, you know, another front in which we're fighting is, is, is that notion of, or the issue of affordability. Uh, and we believe that to kind of, uh, and I think this is really where I, I think I'll, I'll probably hand the mic off and, and stop, but I do want to say that the you know, energy democracy is, I think, really requires, for, for, for everyday people to step into energy democracy, I think it requires a certain amount of uh, financial stability, uh, just material stability, just uh, an absent dealing with just kind of baseline issues of energy security and energy poverty. The invitation for, for at least at PUSH, for our members to, to join us in this effort, it, it's, it's difficult if not, if not impossible. And so I think one of the leading edges of our work in, in combating this reform agenda at the state is to say, we need an energy poverty safety net. We need to ensure that for every utility customer in this state, they're, they're assured of a 6% energy burden uh, tops. Like their, their household won't see more than 6% of their uh, household income go towards energy costs. And that's kind of a, a uni universally recognized standard of affordability. You know, how we get there, that could, you know, right in the here now, that could come through just a direct cash transfer, uh, a utility discount, so discounted rates for, for low-income uh, utility customers. But over time, we think that needs to evolve to address some of those root causes. So let's increase access to weatherization and energy efficiency so that you know, the real cost of people's utility bills come down. Um, we're not just using poor people as a pass-through for utilities uh, you know, with that cash transfer uh, type, type model. Uh, so, so we're really kind of pushing on the state to honor a commitment to a 6% energy affordability standard just as a baseline to enable people to then uh, act democratically and to participate with one another to kind of think about you know, some of the, the bigger, higher level issues around um, you know, the kind of the programs we want to build, the types of uh, non-extractive business models we want to advance and, uh, and all that. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and I'll hand it off to... Uh, thanks, Clark, and uh, I'm sure people appreciate uh, understanding a little bit more about what's being touted as uh, the New York's, you know, <clears throat> big contribution to the energy future here and a little bit of an explanation of what that entails. So thank you so much. Uh, Denise? Good morning, everyone. Are you still there? Yes. All right. It's all good? Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm very energized around being here and, and talking to folks that are on the ground and making change happen. Um, I'm, I'm Denise Fairchild. I'm with Emerald Cities. Emerald Cities is a national organization. Um, it's a coalition of labor, business, community organizations trying to build uh, a sustainable, just, and fully inclusive economy. Um, and for those of you, I mean, I won't go into a lot of details, but um, there is there, there's an infographic up here that helps you, you can pick up after or before you leave, that really tries to tell the Emerald City story about, well, you know, we have this vision. We have this vision of an Emerald City, right? And what does an Emerald City look like? And it is, you know, Dorothy on that <laughs> yellow brick road, and it is about sustainability, you know, and how we 
live within the ecosystem and, and see ourselves as integral to it, not exploitive of it. It is about local control and self-determination. It is about an energy system that is um, decentralized and um, distributive. So, so we've, we've got the sense that there is a, a new way of, of living, right? And, but part of that Emerald City vision is then, what is the process? What is that process of getting there? Um, and so that's what I'm going to talk about and give you some examples of what we're trying to do to get to our Emerald Cities through, through our coalition work. Um, and, and let me start with a framing and maybe going a, a little bit back to where Al started us, is that um, the, the reason for this, right, the reason for this is that we're in an existential crisis, right, right now, climate change. And we are at the point of really trying to figure out whether we're going to survive on this planet. The planet's going to survive, right? The question is whether we are going to survive on this planet with climate change, you know, destroying our access to uh, ability to have water, uh, destroying our food systems, um, you know, our, our, our ability to, to even generate income to, to support our families. So with this, this, this question of being able to adapt and to be able to survive, cultural anthropologists say that there is one thing that has allowed us to sort of change and adapt to uh, our environmental change, and that is our culture. Culture is the most important instrument to adaptation, and that is really about our, um, our ideologies, our, our social relationships with one another, it's about our um, you know, modes of thought and patterns of behavior. All of these things are critical to whether or not we're going to be able to reach the Emerald Cities, is our culture. And our culture is really, at this point, is a Western culture. It's a Western culture of private individual rights and privatization and exploitation. That is the culture that we have all bought into. We are all a part of that. You know, materialism, consumerism, that's the cultural environment that we are in. Um, and that's the culture that is actually putting us in this existential crisis. So, anthropo cultural anthropologists say that the, the thing that has allowed us to adapt to environmental change, typically, are, is our energy system and our food systems. Whenever there's a cultural change to how we behave with each other and how we think about things is when the energy systems and food systems change. So when we were hunter-gatherers, you know, what, are, what was our social relationships with were like? When we look, use oxens, you know, different kind of energy system, different kind of social relationship between, you know, males and females and uh, access to, you know, the commons and how we work with each other, don't, and cooperate with each other. Well, this is where we are right now, right? We are in... Uh, environmental change, uh, and when we talk about energy democracy, since energy and food are drivers of cultural change, then we need to really begin to think about how we use energy to change to a different kind of culture, to move out of um, the Western cultural value system that is, that is exploitive of ourselves. But culture doesn't happen uh, it's not amorphous, and social justice and economic justice is not an amorphous idea. This, this system of the, this current economy is, stands up, is, is, is supported by um, institutions, right? And if we're going to dismantle an extractive economy, we have got to dismantle and change the institutions that support it. And fundamentally, that's the work of Emerald Cities, right? Uh, and so what are the, in some of the institutions that we're talking about? We're talking about the financial systems and financial institutions that support the extractive economy. We're talking about our educational systems, you know, because even when you think about when we were in an agricultural economy, right, the educational systems taught folks how to be farmers, right? When we became an industrial economy, our educational system taught us how to be factory workers, right? Um, so what is our educational system doing now, you know, and how are we uh, ensuring that educational system is going to move us into a sustainable, just uh, economy uh, where economic democracy is at the roots? So our financial systems, our educational systems, our labor markets, right, they're propping this stuff up, you know, with a, and that's why we have, con you know, the 
building trades at the table, uh, where we're talking about, you know, an industry that has been discriminatory and exclusive, you know, 100 years of mistreatment of, of, of low income and people of color, and how do we begin to change you know, the, those, those labor systems, those workforce systems that have fundamentally excluded us and how do they begin to not support the extractive economy but see themselves as a part of this new economy? Um, utility systems, right? And Clark talked about it, you know, how we've got to change how they do business and how they do work. So the, the real, so this is, this is not gonna happen overnight and, and part of understanding this work is, is chipping away and getting inside the institutions that support and prop up the extractive economy. So some of the things that Emerald Cities is uh, doing in this work, we, first of all, we're, we are doing this in, in coalition and that's because you cannot change um, social relationships and, and behaviors and institutional rules uh, without having conversations with folks about this ain't working y'all and this is messing, messing things up. So I've got some very, you know, at the board level, obviously, but even in our, even our local sites, very tough conversations that we're having. We're having like the, the youth bills of the world and the conservation corps and the, uh, you know, pub policy community organizations talking to the building trades about uh, breaking down, you know, their, their screens of opportunity for, for folks. Um, we've, got, we've got the business sector talking to, to the government sector. And so we're not going to get to a new place uh, unless people start, and, st and still we start thinking about changing people's ways of, of thinking, their ideologies, their practices, and ad adopting new principles. And, and it's not gonna happen unless we are in every place and that's what you'll see through our, our pathways. Um, every pathway to social equity, to economic justice, to, to, um, to changing our physical infrastructure is going to require all of us to be in all those places and to engage fully and deeply. Um, so in Seattle, uh, just to give a, a few examples, we are, we are working with the um, uh, municipal utility, uh, Seattle Lights, City Lights, and we're working with the Housing Finance Agency to develop a whole new financing platform. Uh, that is now for the first time. The affordable housing sector is one of the most difficult se sectors to get to be um, solar, to be energy efficient for, for a variety of reasons. Um, right now we've got 3,500 uh, low-income affordable housing units in the queue to be retrofitted um, to be energy efficient. How did that happen? We got the utilities to step up and decide to provide you know, on-bill recovery financing to be able to make it easy so that people don't have to put money out of, out of their pockets to make this happen. We got the housing finance agency within the state of Washington to provide low interest, 2% money, unsecured, unheard of, all right? And so affordable housing, unpacking the capital stack, you got four, five, six layers of financing and to, nobody wants to open up the capital stack to retrofit their houses. So to be able to do this, right, without having to actually, you know, show collateral, be secure, um, is unbelievable. So they have to put out no money, they could pay it back on their bills, 3,500. So we're about to replicate, so we're changing how utilities are thinking about this work and working with our communities. We're changing how housing finance agencies are doing this work. We're, we're uh, beginning, we're talking to the Rhode Island Finance Agency and their utilities. So that's, that's one way in which, you know, we're moving institutions to begin to think about um, energy in a different kind of way and particularly how they work with communities of color, low-income communities of color. We're working with um, our community colleges and our institutions. Um, uh, that are, uh, these are community, we're retaking our community institutions to train our people of color, which is where we are. We're, you know, rarely in four-year institutions. We're rarely in uh, Ivy League institutions. But how do we train uh, a pipeline of, of young, uh, motivated uh, community experts around a whole new way of thinking about the economy? Right. Our community colleges are the places where we need to reclaim, take them back, and change them to train, change, uh, to train community change agents. And we're in seven institutions now where seven community colleges are working with the organizing networks in those communities where the organizers are actually the teachers 
uh, and, and creating a credit programs, certificate programs, to create not only activists, all right, because this is through experiential learning, not only activists, but they're actually involved in getting careers through, through degrees, and they can grow a future and support their families. And so we've got young people involved in uh, fossil fuel divestment campaigns. We've got folks you know, involved in anti-gentrification campaigns. Um, we're training you know, you know, thousands. We're looking to change thousands and thousands of young and not so young folks out of these communities to, to uh, use these institutions of learning to legitimize um, a whole new vision and a future of where we need to go. Um, so the educational systems, the workforce systems, the utility systems, the finance systems, I mean, these are the places in which we're, we're doing um, this work. Uh, and, and as well, build, doing model building, you know, on the ground. And our partners in New York are building uh, community-owned and controlled um, energy microgrids. And so that we are, you know, getting off the grid and fundamentally beginning to own these, uh, these energy sources. And, and at the end of the day, who owns the sun and the moon? Who ought to be able to benefit from the sun and the moon? And how, do we, how dare we think that this should be something that is actually monetized for the benefit of the few, for them to accumulate wealth? So we're, we're really trying to develop the new models of, of an energy democracy in, in particular places. So I think I'm just gonna stop there because I'd, I'd love to have a conversation. I guess my main thing uh, to leave with you is that we can't get to energy democracy unless we change our culture, uh, 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 Western culture, to, to reclaim some of the indigenous values and cultures that we have, uh, many of us come from, and that, that are really clear and solid in the, in the global south, you know, where, where in fact, you know, uh, part of the thing that's also propping up uh, this world is, is our constitution, our U.S. constitution which says you, know, you have the right to prop private property, due process and taking clauses. I mean, there's at least three places in the US Constitution that allows the extractive economy to work uh, and, and to be able to exploit the, the environment. The Global South is talking about the rights of the environment, the right to reproduce, the right to regenerate. Their rights is just as important and maybe even more important than the rights of individual. So how do we think about the Constitution as a way of also thinking about the change, the institutional changes that need to take place for this long haul vision for an Emerald City? Great, thank you, uh, Denise. All right, so I first wanted to see if um, you know, any of the panelists had any comments or wanted to take off from something that one of the other panelists said to ask a question or to make a comment or what not, uh, any of you want to uh, comment on each other's comments? <laughs> well, I'd like to ask Clark, you know, the, you know, the REV model is being touted among the utility sectors as like, you know, what, what the utilities are looking to, to save themselves from themselves, you know, or, or this, this major change that's taking place in the energy revolution. How do, how do you guys help the rest of, um, you know, activists around the country to stave off you know, how do we get this knowledge broadly distributed so we can get ahead of the, the way the utilities are going? Thanks, Denise. Uh, no, great question. So I think that's really one of the value adds that we hope the New York Energy Democracy Alliance can begin to provide. And, and so we've, to date, have really for a, more of a New York audience, but I think there's a lot of lessons that could be drawn out, um, have developed you know, a lot of webinar materials, um, fact sheets, memos that try to kind of break down, um, you know, I think some of the, the you know, the, the kind of the, the political economic implications of this transition and, um, and just, you know, lessons around engaging with uh, uh, utility regulators, which I think are kind of a black box for, for most organizers, um, as you know, I'm sure folks, you know, Dawn, I'm looking at you, would maybe attest to, and, uh, you know, in, in, other, in other states. Um, and so uh, I think part of uh, our learning curve has been, uh, you know, just challenging them on their uh, kind of fundamental understandings of public process and public engagement. I think we've recognized, we've, you know, won some real victories there. We've, um, uh, you, know, you know, forced them to open up, you know, more public venues, um, you know, to be more publicly, you know, accountable to uh, you know, testimony that gets kind of aggregated at those, those uh, public hearings. Um, so, you know, I think, and, and then it's, I think, you know, moments like when at this very moment, which is just, you know, coming together 
uh, you know, to talk kind of comprehensively around you know the new economy to ensure that um, uh, you know like energy democracy is kind of a, 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 a you know very much in, embedded in in that kind of overall conversation of, of a new economy. Um, so you know, Mia, do you have any? No. <laughs> Uh, so one of the things I just um, I just realized that we did start late, so we probably don't have that much time. But just wanted to reflect on this, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the uh, work that you do in California, Mia, you have a lot of interaction with state agencies and whatnot. And maybe you could talk a little bit. I mean, you talked about the importance of building political power and some of the ways that in California that political power has been built, and to sort of maybe reflect a little bit. I mean, Denise, you were talking like, I mean, you could almost do this institutional change from the inside uh, and to maybe reflect on to what extent that actually seems possible without that political power base. Right. And I, I assume that in Denise's analysis is both an inside and an outside game, because I know Denise. <laughs> um, but I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think one thing that's worth kind of talking about in terms of like how you actually win energy democracy on the ground is um, this interplay between like real um, deeply rooted organizing on the local level and the state policy work and building new models and implementing state policy like in, in our neighborhoods, being engaged in that. So like there's this, um, what do they call it like a, a virtuous cycle of of learning and of of like reinforcing kind of values in both places that like it really grows from what's needed on the neighborhood level on the local level and then you actually fight for that like at the, at the state level and then when it's implemented you actually make it you learn how to make it work by coming back and building it in the neighborhood so there's that and that informs how we actually do our state policy work. Um, and I think it's really, I mean, the, so New York and California are, are both states where we've been kind of touted as, you know, um, kind of very progressive on energy issues and like um, kind of creating new models. And so I think in California, there's as many, as, mu as many lessons to learn about what we've done wrong as to what we've done well. And like I kind of like like to hold up California as like a flag for like please don't do it this way, <laughs> in in a lot of respects. Although I will say like what you, to your question, Al, about like what I feel like what we've done right in California over the last decade has been to really engage communities of color, really engage the the communities who have been um, really excluded from the um, both the benefits of the like the economic benefits of the. Um, of the fossil fuel economy in, in many ways. Um, although, like, side note, I will say, like, there's been a lot of, like, part of Just Transition is acknowledging that there have been a lot of middle class jobs created for um, working families, and many of those are, are, are working families of color in the industry, and that we need, a, like, a, that's all part of what we talk about when we're transitioning to this localized energy democracy system is is um, a really holding and um, creating a, um, a way to make those uh, workers a part of the, the vision and, uh, and, and trying our best to make those workers whole during the transition. But getting back to, that was my side note, getting the, 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 I think one of the things that we've really built in California is um, this inside outside game that's like really rooted in the power of, of local communities of color. And that, um, I think I mentioned this in our little workshop yesterday, was that like part of what I've seen happen is the shift from um, the center of gravity around energy policy at the state move from the traditional conservationist groups to, the, um, to being the sector of communities of color and equity and environmental justice groups, where that it's now it's our it's 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 our space, and that has like completely shifted the dynamics and shifted the question about who benefits from our energy policy, and 
like who who is supposed to be at the table when we're defining the outcomes for energy policy and and that even the, like I feel like we're still in the middle of that but I think that's been a really huge um, shift for us and has meant that we've been able to win things like billion dollar over 10 year investment in solar on multifamily low income housing. We tried to do that even three years ago and we couldn't, it was impossible. And then like last year, we actually got that done kind of almost without really that much um, people, it, it kind of like happened and it wasn't actually controversial. Whereas before the utilities killed that bill in a couple of days, you know, when we ended up getting. So things like that where you have to, when we're talking about how to, how to best reduce greenhouse gases or how to best create you know, like uh, standards for renewable energy, um, equity is now a central question. And the answers are coming from our communities. Yeah, I, I would. I wanted to explain a little bit more, Alan, because I don't want to be misrepresented in terms of us just being inside players. I think there's a, there's two parts to what I was trying to express. One is that um, folks that have been part of the problem need to also recognize they're part of the problem and start learning about how they stand with us and step up with us on a, a different kind of future. So that's like part of the inside game is getting into you know, the labor unions and the business community to let them know that um, you know, you're, you're in the same sinking boat, okay? And, and what are you gonna do uh, to save yourself if not anybody else? So that's part of the game. And what's been very insightful, so California is, you know, in the, and New York are the best. So, but we're in Ohio, right? So that's a coal producing state. And it's a whole different environment there. And, you know, I won't go into all of it. But anyway, the bottom line is having COSI, which is the, the largest small, uh, ch uh, small chamber of, is a chamber of commerce of small businesses in the country, stand up with the building trades, all right, to, with, with the community to say, we want an office of sustainability, Cuyahoga County, we want an office of sustainability, and we want a community benefits, you know, uh, a community workforce agreement attached to this. So every dollar now, so we've got an office of sustainability, we've got, you know, um, local hire, local procurement, uh, we, we're, we're doing, they're doing community solar, but it's because in a, in a predominantly conservative coal mining producing state, to have an office of sustainability happened because you had these different voices step up. People, I mean, you, we would go to, to hearings and the, the folks at the state level would not even listen to environmentalists. They would just, you know, you know heard it, been there, done that. When African Americans stood up and s said that they wanted to deal with issues of energy and energy democracy, all of a sudden people were looking at them and looking at us and like, what are y'all doing here? And why do you care about this? And it was like, it was, a, it was jarring for them. And so having these you know, new faces and new voices and, and coming from different directions is part of the power and the force that we have to build. And it is, it's an organizing strategy, but you've got to let people know that um, they, need to be, they need to stand with us in this effort. Great, thank you. I was just wondering, like, we are short on time, but maybe if people have a question, they can shout it out and I'll try to repeat it, rather than doing cards and whatnot. Did I see a question over here? Anybody? I'm just afraid we're running short on time because it is, what, 11 o'clock? And the next sessions are supposed to start at 11.15. So I'm sorry about the fact that we started late, but we started late because you weren't here on time. So, I, so I, I'm not going to take the full wrap on that. But I, I, did, I, I did want to uh, invite people. There are, uh, there are all together in the conference, there's, there's uh, 10 sessions, uh, workshop sessions that are part of the Energy Democracy Track. And they deal with a number of the pieces that people have been referring to here. Uh, uh, you know, um, you can take, it's harder to see from your book, but basically the issues of how you engage the community in energy issues, questions about the role of racism in terms of the divisive role that that plays in terms of pulling together our community around these issues, uh, some workshops about, uh, you know, uh, the policy at the state regulatory level and initiatives that are taking place to fight, uh, you know, against the, the utility power that's exercised at the states, 
uh, some sections on like new models for developing renewable energy in the community, um, including cooperatives and uh, community choice programs and so on and so forth, and also uh, sessions that deal with financing and labor questions associated with all this stuff. So it's a very f rich environment and I invite you all uh, to participate and come uh, to some of those sessions uh, that are trying, you know, overall to try to address a lot of the very, uh, you know, many questions that are involved in actually trying to create a new energy system. So again, thank you very much uh, for coming and uh, hope to see you later in the day.